Yeah, I, 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 I'll talk a few minutes to let people show you better. So welcome everybody to this uh, CASP AI seminar that we have. And today we have, um, we're going to talk about, uh, I think actually we're probably going to learn a lot about how AlphaFold and in particular how OpenFold was trained. And I think it's really, many of us have uh, of course read the papers and used AlphaFold, but very few of us have tried to re retrain it. I, mean, I guess there are only a handful of projects that I know where about trying to that. And it's, it, I think it will be very exciting both to learn actually what you can learn from it and also even to realize how what is possible to do. And that's probably something very important if you want to con improve things in the future for next CASP or in the future things. So, so uh, we only have one talk today, so we're not in a hurry. So we have a, we can talk for whatever time it takes and then we have a discussion afterwards. And uh, uh, I guess Nassim, is it okay if people uh, raise a hand and or ask questions during time, or do you prefer to have the questions at the end? Uh, I, I I believe this is a pretty informal setup, so yeah. please feel free to ask and interrupt, and I'm very happy with. It. Yes, yeah. I, I, I'll I'll try to keep a uh, lookout for hands, but if something is very unclear, just shout out in the worst case because I uh, might miss it because there are a few quite a lot of people on the talk call, and. Uh, yeah, and then I just remind you that we will have another seminar in one month, or like in the on June uh, whatever day we have uh, June fourteen. We have our Ming Kyung Beck is going to talk about uh, Rosetta Fold, so then that's it's very related. And uh, yes, and I think it will. Yeah, we can go ahead. So welcome, Nassim, for and looking forward to you talk about the open fold and retraining. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here with you today on Zoom. So I'll I'll be talking about OpenFold. So first, as a nutshell, in a nutshell, what OpenFold is. OpenFold is an open source, trainable, highly accurate, memory efficient, and GPU friendly PyTorch reproduction of AlphaFold two. Uh, because this is a discussion, I will mostly highlight the conceptual aspect and the reason why we did OpenFold. So I will start first by highlighting some current limitations of AlphaFold 2-like system and why we need to think uh, of alternative or extended architectures that might allow us to tackle those limitations. Then I will explain what OpenFold is, what, how we achieve the same accuracy as AlphaFold 2 or the original AlphaFold 2 at least, and I will mostly highlight the most important discovery from my perspective we made by retraining OpenFold, which is how systems like AlphaFold 2 scale in terms of data size and diversity of data. And I will also try to explain how this could be important to take AlphaFold 2-like system beyond protein structure prediction. And then finally, I will tell you a little bit about what we are currently doing what kind of topics and questions we are trying to answer by extending OpenFold. So as you certainly all know, AlphaFold 2, despite its amazing, remarkable achievements first at CASP 14 and CASP 15, there are intrinsic limitations. So one limitation is that AlphaFold 2-like systems, they still struggle with mutations, which is a very important question for biology and structural biology. This is an example from CASP where participants were asked to predict the effect of mutations on changes of uh, conformation for proteins. And uh, as far as I can tell, none of the participant was able to accurately predict and capture the structural changes related to those mutations. So we do know that AlphaFold 2-like systems struggle with understanding and capturing the effects of mutation. Another um, can I interrupt for a second? This is John Malt. I, I mean, I yes. agree Hi. with you that AlphaFold is not very good with mutations. But this, I was discussing it with Andre just yesterday, is actually a bad example. Uh, what the experimentalists think is that the difference is largely due to the crystallization medium, not to um, not handling mutations. Oh. Thank but you. I agree very with your general uh, point. That's... Yeah, I, I didn't know that. So thank you for adding this kind of information. Um, I was not aware of that. So thanks a lot for the information. But uh, I hope we all agree that beyond this specific example at CASP, we do understand that alpha fold 2 like system struggles with mutation. And we do understand what is the reason. And I will highlight a bit the reason later. Uh, another case where 
all participants at CASP struggled are two specific targets that are here listed, T1131 and T1122. And we understand again, the reason for the struggle because we don't have homologous sequences for those targets. And therefore alpha fold two is struggling with orphan proteins or proteins for which we don't have uh, enough information in terms of like MSAs. And so in a nutshell, alpha fold two like systems, they are as good as the amount of coevolutionary information that is available for the corresponding target that would like that we want to fold. That was already, of course, reported uh, prior to CASP 15. This is a figure that you might be familiar with that was reported in the original alpha fold two manuscript, where we see a clear correlation between the performance of alpha fold two in terms of the LDDT metric which is a local metric about the model accuracy and NEF or NF, which is roughly a metric that captures the quality of MSAs in terms of diversity and depth. And so in a nutshell, unlike physics-based methods and unlike what is happening in a cellular environment, alpha fold two is strongly relying on evolutionary information. And this is a major conceptual limitation. So now let me turn to another type of limitation, uh, which is the following. Alpha full two like systems, for good reasons at the beginning, they think of proteins as molecular machines that exist in the vacuum. Uh, and this is certainly not the case. This is not how proteins behave in a cell. Proteins typically they form complexes, very large complexes by forming interactions with other proteins. They uh, interact with nucleic acid, DNA and RNA. They interact with ligands, small like molecules, um, drug-like molecules and cofactors, so on and so forth. Pretty much all this biological context is currently missing in alpha fold two. We may think that this is the next step, which is a fair statement, but it is already affecting the way how alpha fold two like systems are trained. So in a nutshell, as we all know in this audience, the main training data are coming from the PDB, the structural data. But when we typically open a file in PDB, we have multimers, we have proteins binding with uh, small chemical compounds, we have proteins again binding with nucleic acid. But what we typically do is that we will artificially take the proteins or the corresponding protein chains, ignore the biological context, ignore the nucleic acids, the chemical compounds, and then we train alpha fold two like systems. And again, I don't need to convince this audience. This is very artificial. Proteins are not rigid rock. Their conformation depends on their context. And again, that was or part of this uh, discussion was reported in the original alpha fold two manuscript, where we see here a prediction with high accuracy of a side chain uh, from alpha fold two. And the side chain is supposed to kind of interact with the zinc molecule. But as we know, alpha fold two doesn't know anything about zinc or any other type of uh, molecule. So this is again highlighting the fact that in many cases we can predict conformations with very high accuracy using alpha fold two, but we don't know what which to which conformation this prediction would correspond. Is it the APO state? Is it the holo state? Is it um, something else? We don't know because the biological context uh, is lacking. Um, now I will turn briefly to more um, uh, aspects about the architecture itself. I will not dive into the architecture, but I believe many of you know that alpha fold two is based on transformers. Transformers are extremely powerful. This is the sort of state of the art architecture now in machine learning for capturing long range dependencies. The most recent GPT-4 and chat GPT, they are based on transformers, but their efficiency and their ability at capturing long range dependency comes with the price. And the price is that they don't scale very well. So typically a transformer has a quadratic scaling, which is a bottleneck for dealing with proteins and certainly very large protein. On the other hand, alpha fold two has another track, which is explicitly reasoning over the pairwise relationship between residues, somehow building representations over the geometry of the protein uh, in 2D, and somehow maybe implicitly over the uh, over the physics of the protein by capturing those pairwise re relationship. And because we want to enforce 
at least smoothly, a triangular inequality during those updates, this uh, uh, track, the two-dimensional track, squares uh, has a cubic square. So in a nutshell, the current architecture is very expensive. And as you may already know, the solution for alpha fold 2 during training is to artificially crop proteins. So instead of taking full length proteins during training, we will crop proteins at a certain size um, during training. Uh, uh, and that's how we avoid this uh, kind of computational cost. But moving forward and trying to capture more larger complexes and more larger molecular machines using deep learning, we need to tackle this question. We need to find architectures that have the ability at capturing long range dependency, at predicting structures with high accuracy, but that but architectures that might be sub-quadratic. And there are uh, proposals in literature, and we are considering some proposals. And I, I would be happy to say more about those alternatives um, if there are questions. So in a nutshell, AlphaFold2 is a remarkable system. Uh, it has allowed a major development in structural biology and maybe beyond, but it has limitations. And we need to understand how to move forward beyond those limitations. Uh, is there a question? or? Okay, no question. So, and I think it's fair to say that across this partial list of limitations that I have mentioned, we don't see much development following AlphaFold2, with the exception of one domain, which is predicting multimers. For multimers, immediately after the release of AlphaFold2, we have seen a large amount of remarkable work that is now allowing us to tackle the multimer case. So let me just briefly remind you what we have learned from the multimer and how the lessons that we have learned from the multimer might allow us to start tackling the questions that I mentioned. So again, I believe many of you are familiar with the work of Patrick and Arnie. I think they led those efforts of taking the alpha fold two that was trained on monomers and using uh, ways of pairing MSAs of different sequences, they were able to fold now proteins that form uh, complexes. And what is remarkable is that by using their approach, they were already able to outperform pretty much, if not all pre-existing uh, pipelines that were specifically designed for docking proteins and predicting uh, complexes. But we do know that despite those um, uh, results, the state of the art now is achieved by AlphaFold Multimer and the most recent version, AlphaFold 2.3, which is now the state of the art for predicting uh, protein structure. And if we reflect the moment, what was the difference or the main conceptual difference between the AlphaFold Multimer and the idea of using uh, the train system AlphaFold 2 on monomers and then pairing um, um, MSA sequences, the main difference is that AlphaFold Multimer was retrained from scratch, and it was taking into account the corresponding inductive biases for dealing with, uh, 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 there is a question, Let me, I will finish and then I will take the question. So AlphaFold Multimer was taking into account the corresponding and inductive biases to deal with complexes, which was not the case of the original alpha fold two. And, and so therefore the lesson from Multimer is that if we want to move beyond uh, the current limitation of alpha fold two, and uh, if we want to tackle efficiently uh, uh, an ensemble of questions that are relevant for structural biology and biology, we need to have the ability of retraining alpha fold two or extension of alpha fold two um, and the kind of approach that consists at using the current alpha fold 2 with some fine tuning is of course extremely important for uh, allowing us to uh, understand better certain questions in biology but it will not allow us to to make the kind of advances that were achieved by alpha fold 2 multimer so in a nutshell to conclude the first part of my uh, presentation we do have limitations that are related to the current alpha fold 2 and the only way to move forward is retraining the system by accounting for new modalities and new inductive biases. Yeah, there is a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, yeah, I hear you. Know. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, thank you for, for your talk. Uh, just a technical question. 
How do you structure the training set? What information do you transform in tensors? And what dimensions do tensors have? And uh, how do you normalize the coordinates of the PDB files? And uh, one, another that uh, I know it's a complex question. Uh, is it the atomic coordinates uh, that are transformed into tensor or is it the alignment that is transformed into tensors yeah. by uh, one not encoding or uh, another kind of encoding uh, for, for tensors? Yeah. Uh I'm happy to answer this question, but maybe I will let it at the end because it's, it's a bit technical. And uh, yeah, I, I will leave this question uh, for the end if you don't mind. So Perfect. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think there was another question. I saw another hand or no, if not, um, I will continue. Okay, so again, as I said, in a nutshell, uh, the major lesson from the multimer case is that moving forward and trying to extend alpha fold two capabilities is retraining the system. So therefore the question is, how can we retrain AlphaFold2 to, to account for the different questions and different kind of uh, diverse biological setting that I mentioned? And what I hope I will try to um, convey to you today is that OpenFold could be one way among many others, but one way to allow us to retrain the system efficiently and then add to the system new inductive biases or new modalities that will uh, uh, that could tackle the questions or some of the questions that I have mentioned. Uh, again, just to remind you what I said at the beginning, what is open fault in a nutshell? It is a fully open source, trainable, and I insist on trainable, highly accurate, memory efficient, and GPU friendly um, reproduction of alpha 42. Uh, Maybe to the previous question, I will not have time to get into alpha fold two. I believe that most of you are familiar with the main ideas and the main conceptual innovation of alpha fold two in terms of how it uses the attention, how it reasons over proteins in three dimensional space. Uh, but how, otherwise, if you want to learn more about alpha fold two, I gave recently a series of lectures at Harvard where I try to answer the question why alpha fold two is the way it is. So they are available online and they might be useful for some of you. Okay, so for the question of retraining, let me first highlight or contrast the difference between the publicly available version of AlphaFold2 and OpenFold. So AlphaFold2 again, as you know, is highly accurate. This is still the state of the art system for predicting um, protein structures, even post CAS 15 with uh, alpha fold 2.3. Uh, it is built on a platform, JAX, that is familiar to people working with uh, machine learning. Uh, however, uh, the data, and this is maybe related to the previous question, for training alpha fold 2 are not readily available. So as we know, we do use those multiple sequence alignments to extract signals from um, evolutionary uh, uh, to, to extract evolutionary signals in the evil former, those MSAs could be generated, but as many of you know, they are quite expensive to um, kind of uh, generate. Um, on the other hand, OpenFold is highly accurate. It is as accurate, at least as the original AlphaFold 2, uh, not the most recent one, 2.3. It is built on, on a platform, PyTorch. And the reason why we decided to build OpenFold on PyTorch instead of JAX, for the reason that until now, PyTorch is way more popular among the scientific community for building machine learning architectures. And therefore we can use existing modules and existing packages in PyTorch to extend OpenFold for training OpenFold for new tasks. And that's the reason why we decided to build OpenFold on PyTorch. On the other hand, uh, we decided to release all the data, all the MSAs and the corresponding templates for training OpenFold and AlphaFold2-like system. They are publicly available. So anyone who would like to use those MSAs for training proteins or for other tasks, they are publicly available. But maybe the most important point back to my earlier discussion is about whether those systems are trainable. The publicly available version of AlphaFold2 lacks important modules that do not allow you to easily train the system. It lacks some losses and loss functions. Um, whereas on the other hand, the publicly available version of OpenFold is complete. It contains all the components of the code that can allow you to retrain the system from scratch by yourself. So in a nutshell, 
If you want to do the exercise on your end, you can take the data that we have released, the MSAs and the templates, you can take the code and you can retrain the system end to end. And I believe uh, some people in the audience or uh, uh, some um, other groups uh, have indeed retrained uh, OpenFold. Some of you might be um, aware about this offer uh, effort of OpenBioML and the OpenBioML group retrained OpenFold uh, from scratch. Um, so, and because we have this ability at retraining the system, now we can start asking questions that are beyond the original alpha fold two. And let me give you the very first example, I think the very first important application of OpenFold, which is the ESM2 model. So some of you might be familiar with ESM2, but maybe let me tell you a few words. So ESM2 is a system that is predicting proteins using an alternative strategy with respect to the original alpha fold two. So alpha fold two like systems, they take as input, again, the multiple sequence alignment. ESM2 is following a strategy inspired from large language models. So instead of taking the MSAs, we pre-train a large language system using masking strategies, again, very familiar in large language systems. We generate some embeddings. And then the input is a single sequence instead of those lists of MSA, but the single sequence has a much richer information that is coming from this pre-trained system. It has those embeddings. So that's the starting point for the ESM2 system. You start with those embeddings generated from the uh, um, uh, language model, and then you need to find a folding kind of pathway that map those sequences and their embeddings into a three-dimensional structure. And again, because OpenFold is fully trainable, uh, the uh, uh, team that did ESM2, they picked the ESM2 as an input and they fed it into OpenFold with minor modification. And they were able to fold 3D uh, proteins with very high accuracy, not to the accuracy of alpha fold 2 like system, but on average, those uh, le protein language model following ESM2 are achieving remarkable accuracy. So in a nutshell, how can you now retrain a system that is not taking MSAs and, and templates and you make it reason over sequences and you make it predict protein 3D structure? The modification that you do for OpenFold is pretty simple to understand. So again, in the EVO format track in AlphaFold2, you have an MSA, track that is extracting evolutionary information. You have a pair presentation track and they interact. They have various communication channels. But now instead of having a matrix, you have a single representation. So therefore, instead of reasoning over the MSA using an attention that goes over the sequences to extract correlations between the residues of your protein and an attentional mechanism, a transformer that goes over the column to extract like the modification of the residues across evolution. Now you turn off this colon attention because you only have a sequence, you don't have the MSA. So basically you turn off this colon attention, you don't start with the templates, and this is enough now to take a system like OpenFold and train it using embeddings coming from natural language processing instead of MSAs. Uh, and I hope it's clear by now why it is important to have platforms like OpenFold. For example, this approach could not have been achieved or could not have been achieved easily using the publicly available version code of AlphaFold2, because as I explained, it is lacking certain modules that are important for training. And I believe, and I hope ESM2 model is only one example. And I hope that in the future, we will see more examples of alternative ways of training uh, systems for protein structure prediction or other tasks that are embedded in a structure like OpenFold or similar open source uh, code. Uh, and so just to add a little bit about ESM2, because those protein language model, they take as inputs only sequence, not MSAs. They are more efficient and typically much faster at predicting uh, proteins. And this allowed the ESM group at releasing this uh, ESM atlas, which contains over 600 million proteins from bacteria, viruses, and other microorganisms. And again, this is the 
combination of a protein language model and an efficient folding um, um, uh, open source uh, model, which is open fold. And we believe that across those 600 million proteins, a third is predicted with very high accuracy. So this is, again, a remarkable extension of our understanding of structural biology. Um, OK, so now to build novel architectures based on a system like OpenFold, we need first to convince ourselves that the system is highly accurate. So during training, we decided to track the accuracy of our system using Cameo. I believe you are all familiar with Cameo, which is a sort of uh, a continuous assessment that is trying to reproduce a bit what CASP is doing. But as we all know, CASP is more challenging and CASP is still sort of the gold standard for assessing protein structure prediction. But we picked Cameo because that was uh, the validation set uh, uh, also uh, chosen by AlphaFold2 and Cameo has its own limitation. So, but tracking the performance of OpenFold on Cameo, uh, we achieve the same performance as AlphaFold. So what we see here, we are comparing the performance of OpenFold to AlphaFold, again, using a, a validation set from Cameo, each dot is a protein. We are using the LDDT metric, which captures roughly uh, the amount of accuracy from a local perspective. And the mean LDDT are almost exactly the same between AlphaFold and OpenFold. When we look at the GTTS metric, which is more a global metric to assess uh, protein quality and protein performance, Again, on the same set, uh, Cameo, we achieve roughly the same results as AlphaFold2. And the mean RMSD for AlphaFold2 on this set is 2.25 angstrom. And for OpenFold, it's 2.22 uh, angstrom. Uh, so we achieved parity on Cameo. But as many of you know, uh, at CASP, we ended up, we, we didn't do very well, uh, even compared to the sort of vanilla uh, AlphaFold2. And the reason is pretty simple. Uh, we were submitting uh, targets to CASP while we were, we were still building the system and training the system and learning all the limitations of what we are doing. So we believe that what we have submitted to CASP 15 was not reflecting the final system that we have trained. So what we did post CASP, we uh, decided to revisit all our uh, submission to CASP 15. And so we looked at domains uh, and by comparing uh, the predicted domains from OpenFold and AlphaFold, we see that there is a, a, a very good concordance between the two. So AlphaFold 2 achieves 74 uh, on the GTTS metric, whereas OpenFold is achieving 73.8. Uh, 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 so they are very comparable. And uh, this is not, again, reflected reflecting what we have submitted at CASP because of this uh, step where we were still training uh, the system. But we believe now that our system is as accurate as the original AlphaFold 2 prior to the recent modification uh, in AlphaFold 2.3. So that's the very first kind of step. Uh, you want to retrain the system. You want to be as close as possible to Alpha fold two, and that's what we tried to achieve. But you have to convince yourself that your system is as accurate as the uh, starting point. Next, the very first, I believe, important observation we made, which was a bit surprising, is the convergence of OpenFold, and I believe Alpha fold two as well. Uh, we observed that OpenFold achieves ninety percent of final accuracy in three percent of training time. This is, I believe, a very important discovery for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. So let me impact a little bit this curve and then explain why I believe this is a very important discovery, certainly for academic group and research. So what we see here, this is the curve that we track uh, during uh, training. Uh, and we are tracking here the performance using, again, LDDT, which is this uh, local metric. And what we see is that very early on during training, we achieve this high performance, almost 90% of the final performance of the system. And why this uh, observation 
is extremely important. In fact, it suggests that we can now explore new variants of OpenFold by retraining OpenFold or adding certain modules in a reasonable amount of time. And again, I insist why this is important. And for academic groups, training systems like OpenFold and AlphaFold 2 is pretty expensive. And many, if not most academic groups might not have access to those resources. So if you may remember, AlphaFold 2 was trained using over 100 TPUs. Uh, OpenFold was uh, trained on a smaller cluster, but still uh, this is a, a, a remarkable amount, substantial amount of compute. But the fact that we can test ideas in a reasonable amount of time, we may not need a large cluster for testing ideas. So just to give you maybe here more concrete numbers. So imagine if you have a cluster of like a dozen GPUs, A100, and you want to reach this accuracy, the 90% final accuracy, you can reach this uh, 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 level of accuracy in less than a week. So which is quite reasonable. So for exploration, for exploring ideas and trying to extend open fold like systems, we don't need, first of all, a very large cluster, and we don't need to train the system for a very long amount of time. And I believe this is extremely important to push forward AlphaFold 2 or OpenFold or similar systems in a sort of efficient way. We don't need the resources of large industry lab for exploration and moving forward those architectures. Um, next, I will talk about open fold ability at generalizing. Uh, and I believe I will stress this, and that would be my main kind of conceptual discussion, because I think this is the most important aspect that we have learned during training. But before mentioning what we have learned specifically, let me turn a little bit to large language models. And again, the reason is that much of the development we see in protein biology, in machine learning, is to a large extent coming from large language models. And, and, and the reason I think is pretty kind of easy to understand, there is a major investment from industry labs because this is tightly connected to uh, their industry. Uh, and this is a sort of evolutionary tree that explains the development of large language models from GPT-1 to GPT-2 to BERT until the most recent GPT-4 and Bard and Claude and Lama, many others. But if we ask ourselves what really prompted those developments and uh, what allowed this kind of remarkable progress in large language models in kind of a uh, short period of time from 2018 until now, and what kind of lessons we can learn for biology. Of course, many um, there are many aspects that like explain this remarkable progress, um, better implementation, for instance, for the transformer architecture that is still state of the art. But the guiding principle was understanding how those architectures scale. And there is this very important paper by a group at OpenAI who now left and uh, um, started Anthropic AI. But in this paper, they ask the question how language models scale. And they look at three different sort of parameters. They look at the parameters of the model itself. Uh, they look at the data size and the compute used for training those systems. And in a way, they discover a sort of rules that dictate the behavior of those, those neural networks. And what they notice here, so what you see on the y-axis is the performance, roughly, of the system. The lower, the better. And then what you see on the x-axis is the amount of data we use, the parameters, the compute, so on and so forth. And there is a very nice correlation between those parameters and the performance. They follow a specific law, which is a power law, very familiar to people in biophysics and uh, physics. And in a way, if you want to think about those laws, as if your neural net is a physical system with some interacting modules, the neuron units, you have some macroscopic variables, if this is like a thermodynamical system, and you want to understand how the neural net behaves with respect to those macroscopic sort of variables. This can allow us to understand better how those networks work. 
but from a practical perspective, it also allows us to explore better how we improve the performance. And in a nutshell, uh, the discovery of this work is kind of expected. It tells us that bigger, better. More data is better, more parameters is better, more compute is better. What is subtle about this study is how to scale, not by looking at one kind of variables, by only looking at the data or the parameters, how you collectively look at different set of parameters such that you make your performance better. So in a nutshell, understanding how networks scale is very important for understanding their behavior and for improving their performance. Therefore, the question now, how OpenFold and AlphaFold 2 like systems scale with respect to those parameters? Unfortunately, we were not able to do kind of a thorough analysis, but we focused on the data size for a reason that is pretty simple to understand for biologists. And like large language models and pretty much many of the areas and uh, uh, topics in machine learning, data are very expensive in biology and we cannot easily generate data. So one of the major bottleneck, certainly for structural biology, is the amount of data that we can use during training. So what we did, the first experiment we asked, what is the behavior of the performance of OpenFold if we start rescaling the amount of data that we use during training. So let me now try to unpack this plot. So first we start with the uh, sort of non-redundant chains that are available in the PDB. So we have roughly 130,000 chains that we can train. This is the red curve. So when we take what is experimentally available in the PDB, uh, we achieve an LDDT that is around 0. Point, uh, or 80% uh, LDDT. Uh, this is lower than the numbers that I mentioned earlier, because for those experiments, to avoid any confounding factor, we decided not to use the self-distilled set. So just to remind you, the final performance of AlphaFold 2 is trained combining the PDB experimental structure and an in silico self-distilled set. And the combination of the two leads to the final performance so here we decided for the purpose of this experiment only using the PDB um, experimental data. So we start with 130,000 proteins and we actually- uh, uh, So how, then this is much faster training also. It's like, this is, uh, I mean, I'll just stay curious because like you said it takes like a week for, but yeah. that was, this is much smaller. So it's takes yeah. a day or two or something. Uh, slightly more, but it depends on the data. Yeah. Yes, okay. it's slightly faster. You're right. Yeah. So, so that that's a good point because, as I would try to convince you, for exploration, you may not need to train your system using the whole PDB. You can consider subsets, and those subsets are still very informative about the model performance. Thank you for the question. So then, what we started doing, we started randomly sampling chains from the PDB and training with smaller data set. So we considered a data set of 15,000 proteins, which is this orange kind of curve. And surprisingly, at least from my perspective, I was extremely surprised, we achieved exactly the same performance. We achieved about, again, 80%, 0.8 LDDT. Again, this is unlike what we have learned from language models and much of the models that are available in machine learning. And then we went down, we decided to pick randomly 10,000 proteins from the PDB, and we still achieved the same performance as using the full PDB. Uh, we went down to 5,000, which is this green curve. For 5,000, we see that there is a decrease in performance, but still the decrease is not substantial. The performance is above 0.7. We haven't systematically tested those models against sort of CASP targets. We could do that, but it might be the case that an AlphaFold 2 like system, an OpenFold trained using only 5,000 proteins might outperform any pipeline that was published before AlphaFold 2, all the kind of prior systems that were around in computational biology. Again, suggesting that here, 
what might matter most is not the amount of data that we can use. And then we went all the way down to 1,000 proteins. So what you see here, the blue curve, this is OpenFold trained using only 1,000 proteins randomly sampled from the PDB. And again, to my big surprise, we achieved the performance that is higher than uh, 0.6 LDDT. So in a nutshell, there is a very intricate kind of scaling between data and performance for protein structure prediction. And I believe this is a very important conceptual discovery, but this discovery might impact the type of question that I mentioned kind of earlier. Uh, now, I would have loved to kind of pursue certain experiments that I will share with you. I mentioned earlier self-distillation. So if to remind you, the currently available weights for alpha fold 2 they are based on experimentally available structures plus self-distillation. Now we can imagine the following thought experiment. So imagine we only had 1,000 proteins available in the PDB or non-redundant proteins, and that's it. Uh, we would start with what is available. We achieve the performance uh, that is uh, recapitulated by the blue curve. It is a decent performance, but not highly accurate. Can we now imagine using a strategy like self-distillation on the 1,000 proteins and slowly increasing the training set by combining experimentally available proteins and in silico generated protein such that we close the gap between 1,000 and the full PDB? We may do this kind of uh, thought experiment. And why I believe this experiment is very important because there are many situations in biology where we don't have much data. So is it the case that we could successfully tackle questions in structural biology and beyond where data are sparse as low as 1000s using the right architecture? And to sum up, my take home message from this analysis is that scaling is subtle, and I may speculate why, that scaling is not following what we see uh, in other kind of area in kind of machine learning. And more importantly, it might suggest that the way forward is building architectures that correspond to the correct inductive biases for the problem, as AlphaFold 2 did for proteins. And if we succeed at building the right architectures with the right inductive biases, we may start tackling questions for which we don't have much data available, including experimental data. So very briefly, we also looked whether templates could affect this kind of scaling behavior. And what we have noticed is that templates are not really affecting uh, this analysis. Uh, and as I said, this is very important because there are many cases in biology where we don't have much data. So this is just comparing the uh, number of total chains that are available in the PDB for proteins. We have about slightly over 600,000 chains before filtering and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, there are a couple of questions in the chat, I think, can oh, so like, be I, I guess the main question is something I thought about also is that there are, uh, are these uh, in the validation of your models there, are they done on an independent set that is the same in every case? Exactly the same set. Okay. Of course, a controlled experiment. Yeah, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you asked it. Yeah, well, from Keith uh, Yapri Praga. Yeah. yeah, so to have a controlled experiment, we are using exactly the same validation set for all the experiments, right? Um, OK, so now, just to highlight this importance of data, this is the amount of data that are available for single chain proteins in the PDB. What you see here on the right, this is the amount of data available for RNA using the same scale. And I don't need to explain that there is a substantial drop in the amount of data. And again, it depends on our reading. We could be pessimistic and we could say, there is no way to successfully use machine learning approaches to fold RNAs and maybe this is the observation that was made at CASP, where the top participants were not using machine learning, deep learning techniques. Or you could say, based on our analysis, we need to find an architecture that is reflecting the correct inductive biases about RNA biology and RNA geometry. And the case of RNA with very little data 
might correspond to my blue curve. So if you have worked a bit on RNA biology, if you do the kind of filtering for proteins and you keep like the non-redundant chain, you end up with a number that is roughly above 1000. So it's really the blue regime. And so the question is, can we build a successful uh, network that could fold RNAs? That's a discussion for another day. But now let me go, go back to uh, this uh, kind of speculation. Why is it the case that in biology, we don't see the same scaling uh, uh, as say large language model? And maybe one answer is that there is a high redundancy in living organism and life in general in terms of sequence. And we know it. the map between sequence to structure is not unique. It is not the case that every details in your sequence will matter for folding your proteins. Otherwise, we'll be suspicious about sort of fine tuning arguments. And maybe because we have this redundancy in sequence space, the model doesn't kind of improve by adding more data because those data are redundant or they might contain redundancy. So therefore, the next question we ask, how the system will behave if we look at the scaling, not in terms of absolute data size, but in terms of diversity. So how we can think of diversity, I think here biologists, they have many ways of thinking about structural diversity. And there are, as you know, different sort of approaches. There is scope, but there is also CAT, uh, where CAT allows you to think about proteins in terms of different categories from the structural perspective. So you can think of proteins in terms of a class, mainly alpha, mainly beta, architecture, topology, or fold, and so on and so forth. And so we did say now how the system will behave if we train not in terms of data size, but in terms of clusters that belong to different classes and architectures and topology. And so let me share now with you the results. So we start first with the class split. So what we do, we try to build a training set that is mostly alpha. It's not exclusively alpha. I don't need to tell you that it is hard to extract proteins that are only alpha. So we have a set that is containing mostly alpha proteins. And we have a set that is containing mostly beta proteins. And then we train those systems. So the system that is training only or mostly alpha is not seeing beta proteins and vice versa. And then we see that, that, that there is a drop in performance. Again, the baseline is around 0 0.8 when you exclude self-distillation. But still, the performance is really, it, it's reasonable. It's around 0 0.7. So which means if you train a system where you exclude a whole class of proteins, you are still learning uh, something very important about how those uh, proteins fold. Um, this is one example uh, from the validation set. So here we consider a protein that is uh, alpha protein, and we look at the prediction coming from the training regime where we only use mainly alpha proteins. And as expected, the system is capable of folding those proteins with an LDDT that is high, 0 0.88. But then we use the system that was trainly mostly on beta proteins, and there is a drop in performance, but it seems that the system is starting to learn some alpha helices. So the drop is expected, but maybe what is unexpected, it is there is a sort of decent prediction, despite the fact that we have this very kind of aggressive ablation. We are, we are ablating a whole class. This is another example where we start with the beta-like uh, proteins. We now predict this protein using a model that was exclusively trained on mostly alpha proteins. And again, uh, we see that the system is starting to learn what sort of a, a beta sheet could look like. It's not highly accurate, but it is going sort of on the right track. It is hallucinating some alpha helices that do not exist in the ground truth. Uh, on the other hand, the system trained on mostly beta is cap capable at capturing most of the uh, beta sheets. Um, so again, in a nutshell, diversity is uh, impacting the system more than data size. 
and maybe this is vindicating a bit my point about redundancy in biology. What matters more in biology is not the absolute amount of data, it's the diversity of the data. But on the other hand, despite doing those very aggressive sort of ablation, we still have decent models. And maybe here I will open a parenthesis. I'm not an experimentalist and I would not give advice certainly to my to our colleagues in experimental biology, but those lessons maybe could allow us to move forward in structural space by maybe focusing more in extending the amount of ground rule structure and experimental structure in terms of diversity. So maybe now to improve those deep learning systems, there could be a nice synergy between in silico kind of computation and experimental work such that by knowing the limitation of those systems and their power, this could guide the future experimental work by extending the space of available structures for proteins and RNA and maybe complexes such that those systems can uh, improve their accuracy. Very briefly, we turn also to the topology split and the architectural split. So here, uh, as you, th there are different clusters. So we start with like the full kind of topologies and the full architecture, this is in red. And then we start subsampling certain uh, clusters. And of course, as expected, uh, the, the smaller is the cluster that we keep for training, the lower is the performance. But still, even when we kind of cluster about 50% of the available architectures or topologies, we are still achieving sort of a good performance. So in a nutshell, I believe from a conceptual perspective, the most important discovery we did by retraining OpenFold is the behavior with respect to uh, data size and data diversity. And I believe this is conceptually important, but from a practical perspective, it might be even more important for guiding the efforts to answer the questions that I mentioned earlier. Because the questions that I mentioned earlier, many of those questions are situations where the data are sparse. We don't have much data and it's not clear whether AlphaFold 2 like systems and similar strategy will work. And I hope that our system is not certainly providing a thorough answer, but it, it is providing a sort of an intuition about how we should tackle uh, those questions. Now, I will be brief. Uh, we may ask the question about like the topology and why it is important and why the system is affected. I think it's fair to say that to a large extent, alpha fold to like systems, they don't really care much about those categories, about the classes and topology. And, and locally, if we use local metrics like LDDT, which you see here on the right, and again, this is a topology split from Cameo, the system seems to be quite robust with respect to those local kind of uh, metrics. What matter most for those categories is the global kind of metrics, the GDTTS. And I think the intuition in a nutshell, the more you expose your system to a diverse set of architectures and topology, the more domains are seen by the system and the more kind of uh, relationship between those domains are seen by the system and it allows the system to build better global kind of representations over those proteins. Uh, we have learned more about how OpenFold and presumably AlphaFold 2 like systems uh, uh, kind of learn, um, but uh, I, I leave it to you. I, I think I shared with you the manuscript. Uh, you can read the manuscript. I wanted rather to highlight, I believe the most important discovery, both for practical and kind of conceptual perspective. Let me maybe say a little bit about next steps. Uh, here, I don't have results to share with you yet, but just to say, if we accept this view that AlphaFold 2 and OpenFold have this ability to be extended beyond protein structure prediction, what can we do with that, right? So an important question for biology and, and drug discovery is to understand how proteins bind with small molecules, right? This is, I don't need, again, for this audience to highlight how important is this question, and certainly you are all familiar with the recent developments using machine learning and deep learning to tackle those questions. And there are many remarkable systems now. Uh, they are highly or somehow highly accurate and uh, they are much more efficient than traditional methods. But we decided now to take a different perspective, which is co-folding. 
So instead of using the traditional kind of docking, where you start with the complex, where your protein is binding the ligand, you take them apart, and then you dock them again, which is artificial. It's not capturing the fact that you can have induced fit. It's not capturing the fact that uh, when you take a protein or receptor apart from the complex, you don't necessarily have the APO structure. And we do know that existing machine learning systems, they don't generalize well when the protein structure is not available to start with for docking. So inspired again by what we have learned from alpha fold 2 multimer, which is retraining and co-folding is better than docking, we are currently training a system where we take as an input a sequence of protein with the corresponding MSAs and templates like the original alpha fold 2 and the subsequent open fold. But now we have also a track that allows us to take a molecular graph, a two-dimensional representation of this graph. And then we still have the EVO former, but with the, which allows a communication between the ligand and the protein. Just please don't take this very seriously. This is just like a cartoon representation. And then we have a structure module that is now taking the protein residues and the atom of the ligand at the origin, like alpha fold two, and it starts extending the structure and then finally predicting proteins with ligand. So we are, we are very excited. And I, I hope soon we will have some results to share with the community. Uh, another thing for personal reasons, uh, very kind of important for me, going back to the, my earlier discussion, one limitation of alpha fold two like system is that they are as good as the amount of evolutionary information we have. Uh, and this has limitations. I mentioned mutations and uh, situations where we don't have homologs and it's not really capturing the physical folding of a protein. So we are trying to train a system that is not using MSAs, that is not using templates, that is not using protein language model embeddings, a system that takes really as inputs just uh, sequences and we fold those proteins. We are not yet there, but the results again, compared to prior systems published before alpha fold two, they are uh, really sort of encouraging. Uh, I mentioned the RNA case. Uh, we are also uh, building a system on top of open fold such that we can fold proteins. I mentioned earlier that at the last CAST 15, um, the deep learning systems that were submitted at CASP didn't end up doing very well. So it might be the case that there is an intrinsic limitation, but we are pushing a little bit forward. And I mentioned earlier this really critical point. Alpha fold two is powerful because of the fact that we use the correct inductive biases. And my impression is it might be the case that what have been done so far for RNA biology and RNA structure prediction was not accounting for all the type of inductive biases that you want to add. So it might be the case that the conclusion at CAS 15 regarding RNA structure prediction is not final. And maybe there is hope for making those systems better. We are working on it. Uh, I think I should stop for the, uh, I think I talked for too long, but uh, I, yeah, I, I think I will stop here. Happy to take questions. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you again for uh, listening and um, yeah. happy to take questions. Emma, thanks for a very interesting talk. Emma, I, I, as long as you can stay a bit more, I'm sure there are questions. And, and if people have to leave, they have to leave, but that's not. Yeah. But um, I, I can start with just the question, Emma, about your ligand prediction yeah. work. It's like, a, I mean, I, as I see the main problem with ligands is that you basically have a much bigger secret space. Because I assume you divide ligands into some kind of sub uh, common groups, but there are many more than 20 amino acids. So right. how, how do you deal with that? Or, or did you, I mean, there are... Yeah, that, that's a very good question, right? It is true that like diversity wise, um, the space of possible ligands is much larger than uh, the kind of uh, space of like uh, residues for amino acids. So now the model that we are training is a bit naive. Uh, we are taking all what it what is out there in the PDB with some kind of filtering, and we are doing the folding. But next we are starting to explore a little bit more sophisticated kind of approaches. But here I, I will be brief. Right? I, I, but as I saw, as I said, as soon as we have results, we will of course share the results with the community. I believe that maybe here, this is 
an example where self-distillation could be really important, right? Because we have much more data about protein ligand interaction than the kind of structural data that we have in the PDB. So it might be the case that here, the um, self-distilled approach might have much more impact than what we have seen for alpha fold two and protein structure prediction. I mean, there's also a lot of like, uh, I mean, the current diffusion model seems to be very good at predicting uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, flexible, flexible ligand to a fixed protein. I mean, they don't have a flexible protein yet, but so of course, if you could get around that and generate diffusion, I mean, I mean, this the still data you could produce. Exactly, that, that's a good observation. But mm -hmm. as I said, the way how I, how I see it, the current approaches, of course, you know, they, they really kind of are a remarkable kind of advance in the field. But one major limitation is that they have to start with the given receptor, right? So they are as good as the initial condition. When your initial receptor is not available, they don't do very well. And uh, I believe you had a talk last month about, you know, DIFDOC, which is now state of the art, a remarkable system that is combining ideas from mathematics, uh, you know, diffusion on a torus, so a remarkable system. But we do know in the system that when you don't have a structure to start with and you generate a structure, say, I think they use ESM2, there is a drop in performance, right? Because again, the system do not have this ability at like reasoning both over the protein uh, and the ligand. So we do hope that co-folding could be an answer to kind of this approach, which is again, more like- Amen, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for, for me, the drop was much smaller than I thought it would be. So I was kind of impressed by them. But uh, yeah, that's, but I, I, agree, I fully agree that it probably depends from case to case. If you have a very, depends on the binding size. So for GPCR, you probably certainly could fold it for us, mother systems, maybe not. Exactly. Uh, there's, a I, I of, yeah, yeah. there's a question from Keith again. I mean, you want to read it out to Keith or should I read it for you? I could, uh, I could yeah. read it. Um, I just had like a very uh, speculative question. Um, so is it possible to train a open fold like system that has training examples that are both RNA and proteins and ask it to predict the structures of them together in one training run, not protein RNA bindings, yeah. but you can imagine that a open fold like system could start learning physics of, 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 of how atoms and molecules should interact together yeah. to form a uh, 3D structure. Uh, so learning just the physics of of how atoms form together. And yeah. but it seems that you are you are taking a different approach in, in, in that or or it seems that you have a different view of it in that each of these problems will have a different inductive bias no, and that, that, therefore that, that, they will have to be learned separately. No, that's a very good question. So you allow me now to finish my slides, right? Okay, yeah. Uh, this is GPT-4. If you open GPT-4, page one, I just read part of it. We have created GPT-4, the latest milestone in OpenAI's effort in scaling up deep learning. GPT-4 is a large multi-model model, right? So now, if I rephrase your question, you are asking the following specific question. Should we build multi-models for biology? My answer is yes. I think the way forward, and again, the lessons that we have learned are mostly coming from large language models. So in a nutshell, what it means to be multimodal for GPT-4, it takes as input images and text. So you can think of your images as the proteins and the text as your RNA, and it can kind of tackle many different kind of tasks from physics to passing exams in kind of English literature, so on and so forth. That's the aspiration. I believe that the fact that alpha fold 2 was extremely successful at folding proteins, it suggests that really maybe the deep insight is not about just folding protein, uh, by folding, I mean, predicting the structure, of course. It suggests that deep learning is powerful. It could be applied successfully to biology. It could be applied to nucleic acid, chemical compounds, lipids, proteins, so on and so forth. It might be the case that we don't need much data. That's what I was trying to convey. And it might be the case that at some point, we will build a very large scale model that is reasoning over all those chemical modalities. And this might allow us to have the equivalent of a sort of universal kind of architecture that is reasoning over the chemistry of life. 
and it might be one step to start asking mechanistic questions from a structural perspective about, say, a cell as a unit uh, of, we wrote a small news and views for those of you in structural biology, where we were trying to say that alpha fold two true power might not be about proteins, but it's really about cells and organisms. And very briefly, some of you might have read many perspectives by very distinguished biologists, Paul Nurse and Sidney Brenner, really trying to push the field forward, saying how we should move forward. We should have mathematical quantitative understanding of a cell as a unit, starting from the kind of chemistry and the underlying kind of molecular machines and a multimodal kind of approach could allow us to start answering those questions. Now, you might say this is contradicting what I mentioned. <coughs> Sorry, yeah, can I, you might say this is contradicting what I mentioned like a little bit earlier. It's just, you need to be realistic, right? We are a small team. You need to take one problem at a time if you kind of dive in immediately at building this kind of large model, you might fail. I will just finish to say, I believe that there are already certain attempts. My reading of the Baker group is that they are trying to build this kind of modality. Some of you may know that they had Rosetta Fold and then the Rosetta Fold 2, which seems to be catching up with Alpha Fold 2. And then they had Rosetta Fold DNA, which accounts also for nucleic acid. And I think they have a system that is quite similar than the co-folding that I have suggested. So I think there are attempts out there. And finally, I think once we have, when we kind of get better understanding, I believe the way forward is to build one system that is reasoning over all the chemistry with one single type of weights like GPT-4 GPT that might allow us to ask many questions about cellular mechanism but that's like more long-term. I hope I answered your question. So Keith, you have nothing more to say? I mean, your hand is up. Uh, yeah, um, it does answer my question. Uh, that is the aspiration. Um, but my understanding of the field too right now is that in that rather in, in, in particular in, in AlphaFold 2, how the, how, how, how the structure is, is encoded in the structure module is very protein specific that it, it that it's looking at a very certain particular set of atoms like the backbone atoms of, of a protein and yeah. using these backbone atoms to orient themselves and uh, using a tension between these very particular sets of protein atoms so what i a, am not really seeing from the field right now and i don't know what the the uh, state of the art is it is, is is how to um um interpret or to how to cast structures not just protein structures but I, uh, I agree. That, that's a great question I, I, but let me also maybe articulate my point about the vision i don't think that the current alpha fold 2 would be this kind of final multimodal system i'm saying that alpha fold 2 is providing reasons of optimism and it's the beginning it's not certainly kind of the final architecture and that's why you know, I shared with you this kind of evolutionary trees for large language models, right? So you have the GPT-1 and GPT-2, and um, the, the tree was suggesting that you know, we are moving in a journey that allows us to make those systems better and better. But it was not saying that GPT-1 would achieve the kind of performance as GPT-4. So that's a high level kind of question. Yes, regarding your question about the structure module, I have a few comments. So first of all, I think that by now, there is a good understanding that the major components of alpha fold two is not really the structure module. The major component is the evil forerunner. That's really what kind of the computation is happening. And what is the evidence for that? Uh, you may know that at CAS 15, some participants submitted highly accurate kind of structures that were based on the evil former and then something else, like a physics-based method that was like folding the kind of distograms. And so in terms of like learning those um, signals to fold the protein, I believe the evil former is key. Now, the main advantage of like the structure module is that it allows you to have an end-to-end -end training. That's number one. And number two, it's much more faster at folding proteins because any system that was submitted at CASP or beyond CASP that is taking only the evil former and then turning to kind of physics-based methods for folding proteins, those systems are very expensive 
if you want like to scale those systems. Now, back to your question about the existing structure module in Alpha 4.2. I think we need to unpack a little bit more this module, right? Uh, so I, I, will, I don't want to get too much into the technicalities, but so for instance, there is something that is tied to the way how protein geometry is uh, organized. It's this extended geometrically aware module called the IPA, the Invariant Point Attention in the structure module that is in a way tied to how proteins work. But it turns out that IPA might not be as important as what we might have previously assumed. And there is an ablation study in the Alpha, Alpha 42 paper. When they take the IPA out of the system, they still achieve roughly the same kind of performance. If you add recycling, there is a substantial drop. But IPA alone is not kind of very important. On the other hand, uh, if you take IPA away, you still have those framing strategies that are over those kind of residues. You have those trying, you know, for some of you are familiar, or I believe most of you are familiar, you have like this gas of triangles in alpha fold two uh, that you update and you assign frames to those kind of triangles. This is clearly intrinsic sort of to proteins, but you can also imagine a scenario where you don't have frames. You can imagine a scenario where you say, I only want to predict the C alpha trace. And if you only predict the C alpha trace, you can very well have an alpha photo 2 system that is only reasoning over atomic coordinates without frames. Uh, how you will deal with the loss functions like fate, the frame align uh, uh, point error. I, I think that's not completely clear because fate seems to be kind of critical for performance. But in a nutshell, what I wanted to say, one can imagine alternative structure modules to the current alpha fold two that are not exactly tied to the protein problem. And this might allow you to reason over nucleic acid and proteins and so on and so forth. Maybe I'll add one last observation. I think about the inductive bias, right? What I have seen in the RNA world and which might explain, again, this is you know, speculative, um, which might explain the current limitation for those RNA pipeline is that in the structural module, they follow a strategy very similar to proteins. Namely, uh, they assign a frame to the phosphate along the backbone for RNA, and then they predict the remaining atoms using torsion angles, right? Following a bit like what alpha fold two, you have a, a frame assigned to C alpha, and then you add torsion angles to kind of complement the remaining atoms, including in the side chain. This might not be, uh, I don't have results to share with you, but this not might be a good strategy for RNA. So RNA bases play a more important role. Uh, there are more torsion angles along the backbone. So you have six instead of three. So I agree with your comment in the sense where you have to be careful when you extend those kind of geometries. But my answer, my tentative answer is to say, Alpha fold two is the beginning, and we might have alternative structure modules that might have the ability to reason more broadly over different molecular systems without being tied to the protein geometry. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for, and I think I'm, it's a it's an exciting time to to consider these new possibilities. So, thank you for your in depth answer. Appreciate it. Thank you. I think Patrick has a question. Yeah, yeah. Last question, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to ask, like you. To me, why any of, of this works is uh, is kind of due to the equivariance, right? It's, uh, it's kind of a graph network, and that's probably why you can extend it to complexes as well, right? There's similar relationships to find. And as you mentioned, the structural module may not be that important, but you still need to kind of be able to find some kind of pairwise correlations between something in there, right? Yeah. So to me, this is still very much a data problem, and like what data we need for other types of molecules. Yeah, so th that's a very good question. But first, I want just to articulate maybe my answer, right? I, I, I don't want also to kind of completely dismiss it and say that the structure module like uh, is useless, right? I, I just wanted to say that um, if you want to think about alternative, maybe there are alternatives of like building different type of like structure modules. That, that was my point. And maybe if I want to articulate my point, maybe a little bit more, maybe to give a little bit more evidence, right? Uh, Rosetta Fold 2, as far as I can, as far as I understand, is really now catching up with Alpha Fold 2, right? And like the, the previous one. So, but what is explaining the fact that slowly Rosetta Fold is catching up with Alpha Fold 2? I think there are many things. 
the loss function, if I understand, they use FAPE, but it's not the structural kind of reasoning because Rosetta Fold 2, as many of you may know, right, they use another type of equivariant update, which is the SE3 transformer. But I think the evidence based on Rosetta Fold 2 and Alpha Fold 2 is that those specific components the IPA and the SC3 transformer, they are not critical. You can use them or you can use something else. It doesn't seem to affect kind of the final performance. I don't know again, whether the Rosetta Fold team did an extensive or did like an ablation study, but I think it would be interesting to know if they have ablated the SC3 transformer or part of it and whether it has affected the performance. My expectation is that the SC3 transformer would not affect much of the kind of Rosetta Fold performance. So I, I agree with your comment, and I agree with you like that th this type of reasoning is very important, but it's just I have the impression that what is currently available is not sort of central for understanding the performance of Alpha Fold 2 and Rosetta Fold 2. Okay, and I think we thank you, and I just remind you that in, in the four weeks or whatever, it's we have uh, Min Kung talking about uh, Rosetta Fold. So it's a perfect continuation of this talk. It's like, okay. so I, I think we all are, I mean, it was an excellent talk and really, really useful. So thank, thank you. you a lot. And uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and bye everybody. Have a nice, whatever to handle the day it is. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Ona. -bye. Bye,